We're launching into a three-part series this week on the Gospel of Matthew. I'm calling it Jesus' Spiritual Disciplines, and we're going to look at the three disciplines that Jesus taught here in Matthew chapter 6. So he speaks of giving, he speaks of praying, and he speaks of fasting. And this week we're looking at giving, and I think that Jesus' teaching here is pretty simple. He says, he, he calls us to give. And, and you read that he says, whenever you give and whenever you pray and whenever you fast, which means that these are three disciplines, three acts that Jesus expects his disciples, his students, are going to be participating in and, and living out. And, and so we want to pay attention to what Jesus is teaching here in, in the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm really attracted to these words and to this, this section because it's a place where you really see Jesus vision of things, the way that life is going to be lived in the kingdom. And when I talk about spiritual disciplines, one of the ways that we might think about spiritual disciplines is as practices that are going to form us in the image of God or that are going to allow God to do the forming. And one image that comes to mind is the one that the prophet Isaiah uses when he speaks of God as the potter. He says, you are the potter, we are the clay, mold us and make us, right? And, and I've got that image up on the screen of those potter's hands. And back when I was in college, I took a pottery class, and it, it turns out that one of the hardest things to do in pottery is to get that clay centered on the wheel, right? And if it's not centered... You can't form a bowl or a cup, or you can't do anything with it because the clay is just wobbling around, and that's, there's kind of a trick to it. And so we had too many people signed up for the class that I was signed up for, and what the teacher did was just line everybody up and say, get around one of the wheels and see if you can center the clay, and everybody did that and had such a hard time that next week there was like half, half the students that had originally signed up. <laughs> and so that pretty much weeded out the, the people who weren't persistent. Uh, I persisted, by the way. Uh, but it, you got to get centered on that wheel. The clay's got to get centered. And I, I think of this image as the, an image of spiritual disciplines because these are practices that get us centered, that put us in a place where we can be molded into the image of Christ, where we can be shaped into a way and graced into the life of Christ so that we can be filled with all that God has for us, his blessings and peace and his joy and Back to the fruits of the Spirit that we talked about a couple weeks ago. We, these are disciplines, practices that get us centered so that God can do something with us. And, and today we're talking about giving, which is the first of Jesus' spiritual disciplines that he talks about. And all three of them fit together, and they're, and they're right at the heart of his teachings. And you know, Matthew 5 through 7, this is Jesus' first great sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. It, it is where he lays out his vision for the kingdom of God. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And we see Jesus at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. It says he goes up on a mountainside and he's got his disciples with him and the crowds are following him. And Jesus goes up on a mountainside and he takes this kind of rabbinical posture. The, the ancient rabbis, when they taught, they would actually go and, and they wouldn't be standing. They would, they would sit and we see Jesus pull up a chair or find a rock or I don't know what, but he sits and his disciples gather around him and the crowds are there and he begins to teach them. And here he lays out his, his vision of the kingdom of God. It's, the first part is these blesseds, right? So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And the idea with each of these is that as the kingdom of God is breaking into the world with his ministry and the kingdom encounters these people, that they will be blessed. So wherever they're at, when the kingdom of God comes, there's this moment of encountering God's power and purpose in his kingdom, and that is this moment of, of blessing. So if you're poor and the kingdom comes, you'll be blessed. If you are in mourning when the kingdom comes, you're blessed. If you're meek when the kingdom meets you where you're at, you inherit the earth. And Jesus goes on and he kind of talks about the characteristics of life in the kingdom. It's going to be based on the Old Testament law, but at the same time, it is so much bigger than that. I mean, it's more than an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's reconciliation and turn the other cheek and faithfulness and truthfulness and even love for enemies. And then in chapter 6, right at the heart of everything that Jesus is teaching, we see him 
speak about these three practices. And so follow this if you've got your scriptures. And there's some notes on the right-hand side, by the way, of the bulletin if you need that. But uh, chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 2, notice this. When you give to the needy, or when you give, right? There's the first one. Then verse 5, when you pray, okay? There's the second one. And then verse 16, when you fast, right? So it is give, pray, fast. And notice that it is when, or in some translations, whenever, which is to say that it is when, not if. These are the practices that Jesus expects his people, his students, his disciples, are going to be engaged in. So when you give, when you pray, when you fast, these are Jesus-shaped practices. And these are, he expects us to to be engaged in them, right? It's, It's the when not if, and we see this comprehensive vision for life in the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it very often, the kingdom of heaven. This is what it looks like. Uh, This is who is blessed. This is how we behave in the kingdom. And so here are these practices of people who live in the kingdom, and we're going to want to pay attention to what Jesus says here, because He is laying out what it's going to look like for his people to to follow him. And remember, at the very end of of this this three-chapter sermon, at the very end of chapter 7, Jesus teaches that parable of the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. Remember, there's those two men. They build their houses. One is on the sand. One is on the rock. And the rains came down, the floods came up, and, and the house on the rock does all right. The house on the sand washes away. Do you remember the song when... Your kids, rains came down and floods came up, right? So, so we know that story. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you are like the wise man or the wise woman, you are going to you, build your life on my words. My words are that rock. And so he's saying, listen, do these things. Live this vision. Enter into this kingdom. Because this is the key to the, the good life. This is the, the way that we're going to live the, the blessed life. And, and people, when they heard Jesus speaking at the end of chapter 7, Matthew records in verses 28 and 29 that they were amazed because they knew that he was teaching like one who has authority and they could see the kingdom of God enveloping them all and the, these folds of blessing and joy. He taught not like one of their scribes who could only interpret the law, but as someone who comes and speaks a new word, a powerful word about who God is and who they are before God into history And he's teaching them how to live well. I mean, another way to translate this word blessed is happy. Uh, So so you could say, happy are they uh, whenever the kingdom of God encounters uh, encounters them. If you're poor and you encounter the kingdom of God, you will be happy. Uh, if If you are mourning and you encounter the kingdom of God, you will be happy. And so there's this vision of blessedness, of happiness, of joy, of the goodness of God come to meet us. And it makes sense, right? If, if Jesus, who, who is the individual who embodies that joy and life and blessedness and happiness in the kingdom, if it's his kingdom and it's centered on him and wherever he teaches and is followed and wherever he is at work, there his kingdom is breaking in, then it makes sense that it's going to be a kingdom of his blessedness and happiness. And here he's saying that these are the kingdom acts of his people. It's what he's talking about. And so that's why in verse 1, he begins his teaching here back in chapter 6 and says, be careful, right? So pay attention to this. He says, be careful, be aware, pay attention. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so Jesus, Jesus is telling them, he's kind of uh, alluding to, foreshadowing what is to come. Because we remember that Jesus, at the end of the Gospels, at the end of his earthly life, in his earthly teachings, he goes into that upper room, and on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he gave it to his disciples. And that giving... That act of self-offering is going to set the tone for his entire ministry. It's what it's po- he's pointing to right now, and it's what the church has pointed to for all of its history and will point to for all of eternity, that Jesus gives himself. This act of giving, 
is at the heart of the kingdom. And Jesus showed that when he broke that bread. And that's what he's even got in mind now, I'm sure. Because he graces us with his very life. And that act of giving is permanent. It's Jesus' permanent way of coming to us. Pastor Beth Jarrett puts it this way. We are called to live as people of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so the word Jesus uses here is righteousness, right? He says, be careful of doing your righteousness or practicing your righteousness before other people. And what righteousness is, is how we respond to God. It is right living with God and then right living with others. And it's really at the heart of the kingdom. It's this idea of rightness before God. Not that we know everything, that we're intellectually right, but that we are right with God and right with others, that we're living according to who God is. And Jesus talks about this. He said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he told at another place in Matthew 10, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. So we're called to righteousness. And righteousness is the the kingdom way of living. And it's interesting because the literal way that, that Jesus says it here is be careful that you don't do your righteousness before others, that you don't do your righteousness, which makes me understand that righteousness is something that we do. It's not just kind of a state that we enter into. It is an act. It's a practice. It's a way of life. And, and Jesus is saying, look, it's about God. It's not about how others are going to see us. And I think that goes for all of these spiritual disciplines that Jesus teaches here in Matthew chapter 6, that the giving, the praying, the fasting, is that they're all about God. They're not something that we do to make others think that we're good or we're holy or, or whatever. They are all focused on God, and we do them for God, and we do them to God. So we pray to God, and we fast for God, and we give what we are to God, and it's all for His eyes alone. And maybe that doesn't seem like that big of a deal to you. Like, maybe that's kind of obvious. But I think this is something central. I mean, if you look at this, Jesus doesn't say anything about how much we give, although he does pick that up in Matthew 23, 23, where he uses that very ancient biblical word, the tithe, the the 10%. But, But here is where he focuses on how we give. And we give in secret. Verse 2. Um, He says, don't announce with a trumpet, right, what you're giving. is then verse 3, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And then verse 4, let your giving be in secret, which makes sense, right? Because these are all practices that are centered in God, and they're about our relationship with God. They're not about building up our reputation with other people. They are spiritual disciplines, which means that we are, there are things that we are going to do regularly because we want to deepen our relationship with God. And, and this doesn't mean, when he says, like, don't let your right hand know what your, your left hand know what your right hand is doing, this doesn't mean that we, we kind of uh, let our finances be a little wild and crazy. And he, it doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to how much we're giving. I think quite the opposite. One of the disciplines that kind of flows out of the discipline of giving or the discipline of tithing is that we have to figure out how much we make and how much we have. And really, with a clear-eyed sense of, of who God is and what our priorities are, say how we're going to spend our money. So when he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, it's not that you reach into your pocket and whatever you get, you put, and you kind of don't see what it is. You know, it could be a one, it could be a fiver, it could be a Benjamin, it could be a bubblegum wrapper. Um, but um, he's saying, no, you got just, you're not going to announce it. It's between you and God. It's about your relationship with God. You're doing it for God and you're giving to God. You're not going to be, it doesn't mean that you, you let your finances go willy-nilly and, and And so I think we've got to understand what he's talking about there, that it's for God's glory. And and verse 4, it talks about how our Father in heaven will reward us. And I don't know about you, right? I I can get this, like, yeah, it's not about, I don't want other people to see, you know, what I give. It's not about my reputation. It's about me and God. I get that. But the reward piece, 
That, that, that one can make me feel a little bit uncomfortable because, I mean, it's not how I operate, right? If, and I think you're probably like me, that when we, we help somebody out or care about somebody or pray with someone or whatever, we, we do those things not thinking about it as, as an investment for the future, but just as what you're supposed to do, just as how God's people are to act. And down a little bit farther in this passage, in verse 19 and 20, Jesus talks about storing up treasures in heaven. And so what I think we got to do is remember the bigger picture here, and that the key to understanding this is really verse 2, that if we practice our righteousness, it's kind of looking at the opposite. If we practice our righteousness before other people, then Jesus is saying it's the law of cause and effect. If that's what you want and that's what you do and you kind of align your values in that way, then you will get your reward, right? He says that they have received their reward. So if you, trump, if you blow a trumpet and put the big check in, well, people will notice that and they'll pat you on the back. You'll get your reward. But if you do, you give towards God, and the same applies to the praying and the fasting, if you give towards God and you are focused on God and, that, and He is who you are seeking, then that is the reward you will get, which in, a, in one way is to say that our reward will be God himself. That if we are doing these things to get centered on that wheel and be formed by God, if we are doing these things because we want to be emptied of, of things in our life and filled with God, that will be our reward. He's saying you'll get what you're seeking. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. He's saying, if you focus on God, then that is where God's going to meet you. And so I think that's really the key to helping us understand what he's talking about here. It's not some kind of reward that is other than or in addition to God. It is simply communion, righteousness, the presence of God. Uh, and, and Jesus talks about this all through the Gospels. Re rejoice and be glad, he says. Great is your reward in heaven. And, and whoever welcomes a, a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of righteousness. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to a little one in my name will not lose their reward. And, and so we've got to kind of keep that in mind, that this is a, a basic way that we enter into God's presence and receive the reward of his blessing. And, and these are three basic practices that he teaches here to enter into the kingdom of God, see the kingdom of your, in your life. And you see, I'm, I'm convinced that what Jesus teaches here, that these are life-shaping activities, the, the giving and the praying and the fasting. This is how the clay gets centered on the wheel and gets formed, because we are creatures of habit, and if we practice holy habits, then at some point they kind of start to stick and shape us. And you see, it's not a question of if. We're going to be shaped because something in our lives is going to shape us. It's not a question of if we'll have habits because we will. It's all about what's going to shape us and who's going to shape us. And it may be family and friends and it may be gravity and genetics and the screen on our smartphone and TV and radio, but something and somebody is going to influence us and is going to shape us. It may be our hunger for money and power and food, but something will shape us. And, and these ways that Jesus is speaking of here, of being shaped by God and getting centered on that wheel, these are ways that we make the kingdom of God concrete in our lives. And so if we give and pray and fast, if we're aiming our lives at God and opening ourselves up to God, then it will be God who shapes us. And there are other things that you can do to practice the, the kingdom and make the kingdom concrete in your life. I mean, Jesus took time away for silence. Jesus had time to study the scriptures, and he practiced the fine art of celebration. But there are not less than these three. These are the, the three spiritual disciplines that Jesus teaches as lying close to the heart of the kingdom way of life. And you know, what, what strikes me about all of these things is that they, they are spiritual disciplines, the, the giving, the praying, the fasting, they're disciplines of letting go. And I think it's because if we're going to be shaped by God, then we sort of have to learn to let go of certain things in our life. We've got to, to come before God with this 
wholehearted sense of giving all that we have and all that we are to him. And it's interesting because in, in Deuteronomy 16, 16, God tells his people that no one is to come before him empty-handed, which points us to the reality that this definitive act of worship is to give our life to God, right? And to give who we are and all that we have to God and to live into service of him. No one's to come before me empty-handed, uh, God said in Deuteronomy. But the weird thing is that at the same time, it's really impossible to come before God unless we come empty-handed, right? We've we got to give it to him and then kind of just stand empty before him and say, Lord, I, I give over all that I am, and, and I, I bring that to you, and it is that you've gifted me, and I gift back to you, and here I am empty. Mold me, and make me, and form me, and fill me. And that is what we're saying with these disciplines. And you'll notice that these are three disciplines that directly challenge such points of of power in, in, in our lives or in the, in the world. I mean, these are places that we can easily slip up, right? And I mean, we got to offer without reserve. Um, and, and offering without reserve, I mean, it's, it's giving over our material goods. And then it's, it's saying that there is no food that will fill me like you. And it's saying that there's no power that can accomplish what you accomplish in prayer. And, and all of it is that we, we're given all that we have and all that we are our whole life to him. Learning to die a little bit to ourselves so that we can live a little bit more to Christ. And if you look at these, they're each one a direct challenge to these powerful influences in our lives. I mean, money, power, food, it's, it's all there. It is totally loaded. So it, we, we need money, and we, we need a sense of personal power, and we need food, and yet we, we give away something that is good in order to be able to give ourselves wholly to God. And Jesus says that as basic as each of these things is in our life, that we have to learn to set them aside. We've got to learn to give them over to God so that we can be open to something greater because we cannot serve two masters. We cannot love, we'll love the one and we'll hate the other. Cannot serve God in wealth. Cannot serve God in our own power to make things happen. We cannot serve God and food. And this is why Jesus says, be careful. Right? I mean, he says, be careful. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before other people. Pay attention, because these are easy places to slip up and get drawn into thinking that giving and praying and fasting are meant to further our personal life goals and our sense of self-worth. And because, I mean, that's what everything else is in life, right? It's to get points on our resume or something like that. And so this is totally countercultural. It's a totally different vision of the kingdom of God. It's, it's kingdom cultural, right? It's leading us to this new culture, this kingdom culture. And so here's the thing. I mean, when we're talking about giving, we need money. And money is, a, is an important part of life. But it's dangerous to us. And it's, it's just like food. I mean, we need it and we enjoy it. And, but we can have this sort of distorted and, and tortured relationship with food, and, and so the same thing with money, right? And that's why greed is one of the seven deadly sins and why graceful generosity is its antidote. And so we've got to think about what this giving is, right? Because Jesus is challenging these places in us and says, what do we rely on? Where do we put our hope and our faith? And he's challenging it with a different sort of practice that will open us up to God's working, uh, and what is giving, right, in all of these senses? Because it's not just getting rid of our stuff. I think it's really about having a right relationship with our stuff. You can only give away what you control and own, and whatever controls or owns us, well, we can't give that away. We're under its power. And there's something about learning to give in the Jesus way that kind of recenters us in a right relationship to our money. And so these are, these are practices that challenge our most basic understandings and assumptions about life and how it should be lived, which is precisely the point. And practices that shape us into a kingdom way of life, that school us into Christ's likeness, that make us vessels that can be filled by God. This is how we get centered on the wheel. 
And all these things have got to be brought into control if we're going to be serious about Jesus, being Jesus' disciples because this is the kingdom way of life. This is the Jesus way of life. And we focus on God and everything else in our lives realigns itself around that. And we give to God and we pray to God and we fast for God. And it's a secret because it's God as our focus and it's Jesus' ancient rule that seek and you find, knock and the doors open. And in some ways, it's really that simple. We aim for God and we find God and this just impacts our life and shapes us. It's kingdom practices that are shaping us into a kingdom way of life. Beryl Jancy, who works for Everence, the kind of investment and, and stewardship branch of the Mennonite church, he talks about ordering our possessions in such a way that God can give us away. And I love that. And I mean, I think this is really the secret, folks. This is kind of what it's all about, that we, we've got to learn to give so that we can learn to be given away by God. Learn to give ourselves to God, and then he'll fill us and use us for his work. And, and you see this in generosity. You, you see this in the way that, that people place our, our, we place our money, and we place our lives, and we place our, our time, we place our work at the service of the kingdom of God. You, you see this, where people are willing to follow Jesus' principle that where your money is, there will your heart be also. And in the end, I think that what we're doing is modeling our lives on God's own generosity, because he's the God who gives abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine. He's the God who, while we were yet sinners, died for us. He's the God that, though he was rich, became poor for our sakes. We've got some beautiful examples of this out there, and Right now, I'm sure you're, a lot of you are in the same position, but my heart is really broken by what's going on on the border, especially on the border with, between Texas and Mexico, where you have people who are seeking freedom from violence and drug trafficking and kidnapping and extortion and general horrific conditions of poverty. And if we, can, we can't hardly wrap our minds around it, I'm sure, of mothers and fathers who put their children on the top of trains to let them cross uh, Mexico, hoping that they can make it into the United States and cross deserts and cross water. And my heart is broken by this situation. But we've also seen some tremendous acts of generosity just bubbling up from among God's people. And there's a, a movement going on right now in McAllen, Texas, where it kind of centered around the Sacred Heart Catholic Church and Christians, not just Catholics, but Christians from of many different churches in the community have come and started a shelter there. Sometimes they're helping 200 people a day, and they give them water and, and food and, and shelter. And sometimes if there's not enough space for them at the church or they're, they're, they need a place to stay for a little bit, they're taking them into their own homes. And, and I'm struck by the words of one of the volunteers there named Hermie Forsage. And she says this, If my neighbor's in trouble, I help my neighbor. And these people are our neighbors. And you know, sometimes I'm afraid that the stuff that we hear on radio or TV is kind of leading us and shaping us and causing us to forget that basic question that they ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? And sometimes I wonder if we've got to just kind of turn off and tune out some of that toxic stuff and tune back in to Jesus and and help us kind of live into that generosity. And, I'm, and I, I don't mean that to... I, 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 one of the things I love about this congregation is our generosity. I mean, we've just loved being a part and seeing how folks are so generous with one another and with us and with this community and with the church. I mean, we're people that give money and give time and give blood, literally give blood and give blood, sweat, and tears in the figurative sense and just... Love on our community with all that we have and all that we are. And I, I've been so blessed and so graced to see that here. I think each of you have shown me different ways of living into who Christ is and living that generosity. And I'm super happy to be a part of that. But you know, we're, we're constantly up in our game and learning more about what it means to be people of God's generosity and Jesus is the one who's going to show us. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. He knows the vision of the good life. And he's teaching us that we'll put our money where our heart is. And we'll do what matters most. And there it is. I mean, that 
This giving is this practice that where we let go and we open up and God graces us with more of himself. He's the potter. We're the clay. Let's get centered. Amen.